the topic for today is uh, uh, artificial intelligence and what I'm going to do in the following uh, half an hour or, or so, probably a little bit longer, uh, is to walk you through uh, some essential topics. The first uh, uh, um, will be, uh, and here you should see uh, the um, um, uh, overview of the uh, presentation. Um, and I will not ask again, but if you can just confirm to me that you are seeing now uh, the, a different slide, then uh, we'll just proceed without any more confirmation. Yes, we see. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this is uh, the um, overview of the talk. Uh, the uh, four topics, um, why AI is uh, divorced uh, between uh, engineered artifacts and any kind of intelligence, let's call it biological intelligence, uh, of course, human included, uh, I, it will take me a little while to convince you, I hope, uh, that this is not a marriage. It's not uh, the ability to engineer intelligence into artifacts, but rather the equally extraordinary transformation of agency into mindless, uh, non-intelligent, but successful agency. Once we grasp that, and it will take a while, uh, what kind of problems that divorce is going to cause? Uh, so the AI ethics um, and why uh, some of the ethical challenges are actually generated by this separation between intelligence and agency, not by the marriage between the two. Then I will move to some of the challenges and finally to uh, the governance of AI. So AI as a divorce, uh, what do I mean by that? we could take a whole course and uh, uh, to explain just that particular point that I'm making in this slide, that digital power to uh, separate, to undo and do together, so a quick paste, things that we have received from the past. So think of uh, uh, the 20th century as um, uh, our legacy, and imagine that the digital, uh, in all its sort of transformations, digital services, technologies, sciences, practices, uh, new habits, is separating, so cutting or putting together, pasting together, things that we have inherited from the past which were not separate or which were separate but not glued together. I will go rather quickly because I know you know, so uh, this is one case uh, where we have glued together online and offline. Uh, the online little word, which has been rather popular these days, is there to remind us that uh, this experience now glues together what already, not still, in the, in the 90s was uh, a, no, two separate experiences. Or the space in which we live, uh, the analog and digital, again, uh, has become a single infosphere where we uh, spend uh, quite a lot of our time. But consider now a, a case of cut, presence and location. Um, that's what the digital has done to us. Uh, until literally last past generation, my, my, my grandparents or even my parents, uh, the idea was that uh, you would be present uh, and located, located physically, present interactively. You could do things where you were placed. Um, you couldn't do things remotely at a distance so easily, so commonly. Today, we know that the digital has unglued presence and location. That's why you can uh, you know, do the shopping uh, wherever you are. We have also unglued uh, law and territoriality. For those of you who come from legal studies, um, that is the map of uh, Europe after uh, the Westphalian uh, peace, uh, or no, series of treaties as we know. Um, after Westphalia, we glue together borders and the scope, uh, the extent of uh, a legal uh, system. Uh, to put it very, very simply, uh, my place, your place, my place, my rules, your place, your rules. That was the Westphalian uh, agreement. Uh, it's no longer like that. Uh, I can ask, no, sorry, answer, uh, uh, if you ask any questions on, for example, the right to be forgotten, uh, the right to be forgotten uh, has made quite clear that in cyberspace, you can't simply impose to Google, for example, to change its uh, search engine when the search engine is actually google.com and it's not Google dot one particular European state. So what I'm going to tell you about AI is part of this broader per uh, perspective. Now, the cut and paste of the digital, and the digital has not pasted, but actually cut 
agency from intelligence. So you can see that here we could go either way. We could uh, uh, endorse the most popular view in the newspapers. I just read uh, some more rubbish uh, today um, where, oh my goodness, uh, no, engineered intelligence is coming. Uh, these robots, for example, there's uh, Amazon uh, warehouse uh, are going to become increasingly intelligent, replace humans, etc. Blah blah blah. Or you could take the other road, uh, this um, sort of roundabout, the one which says, no, sorry, here the digital is not pasting together engineering and biology. It's actually no, uh, separating, ungluing something that we never saw unglued before in the history of humanity. Agency, successful, and intelligence, on the other hand. Uh, remember, whenever we had to do something uh, intelligently in terms of action, it was either a human being, a, a bunch of human beings, or a bunch of human beings plus institution, etc., tools, or animal intelligence, but something somewhere had to have some biological intelligence to achieve something that required no, intelligence. Today we have agency that is able to do that at zero intelligence. And if you want to have an example, more coming is literally my iPhone in my pocket playing chess, zero intelligence and better than anyone attending this seminar. So what do we mean by uh, AI? And I'm now getting into the nature of this divorce. Well, this is just one map among many others is um, also criticizable for a number of reasons. I don't know how closely you can read uh, some of the specific things. But what I want to uh, uh, stress here is that uh, AI has um, really uh, been a great success. So don't get me wrong. Uh, what has determined that success has been the shift from logic to statistics and from deduction to association as the sort of powerhouse, uh, as the sort of um, war horse, uh, so to speak. Uh, the element that makes the whole difference. When I was thinking uh, sort of uh, simple elements of AI uh, in the 90s still, uh, neural networks were just uh, a theoretical um, opportunity. When I wrote an introduction to um, philosophy and computing, uh, the chapter on neural networks is all about how wonderful this you know, toy is, uh, because everything was about logic, mathematical logic and deduction. If then, that was the real kernel. Today is more like something here is related to something there statistically. It's a big shift. It, it really is a new season. Uh, call it season two in the uh, sort of Netflix uh, history of uh, AI. But it is what makes the whole difference. That's why we have something called data science. Now, in this world, uh, as I said, AI is amazingly successful. This is just a quick reminder of, for example, uh, voice recognition. Um, machine speech recognition, accuracy extent over time, and you can find this in a, a variety of other fields, has passed a uh, human uh, accuracy threshold years ago. So when I used to buy a ticket uh, locally at the local uh, cinema, I had to really use my best pronunciation because the poor machine just couldn't get anything in the 90s, especially because the, the damn cinema was in George Street. And unless, as you can tell, you were able to say George Street with that sort of nasal British Queen England, no ticket. Today, I can buy a ticket by saying George Street and, it's, and it gets it all the time. That is an amazing uh, transformation of our uh, AI. This transformation, I'm going to do this rather quickly and I hope that the computer scientists in the group will forgive me. Um, uh, it was a, the old one was like traditional cooking. You would have ingredients, data, you get a recipe, no, an algorithm, and you will get a dish, like a carbonara. Fine, that was quite simple. Input, no, those two things, the output was say, some kind, nice uh, pasta. Machine learning, especially today, um, whether supervised or unsupervised, um, is a different kind of cooking. Look at what I've done here. What you show to the machine, training, quote unquote, are the ingredients, lots of data, the outcome, better be sure that I'll tell you, that is a cat, and you know, the thing uh, learns the recipe. Inverting these relationships and more on this is the thing. The ability to show tons of pictures of a cat, telling the machine that that is a cat, and after all that process, the machine will be able to recognize any cat Mine included, I don't have one, but if I had one, 
which it has never seen. So it will be able to learn how to cook, uh, if you see uh, in the metaphor. Even better, if you do reinforced cooking, so to speak. At that point, all you show to the thing is data. And that will learn that that data belong to a cat data kind and learn how to recognize cats. So this uh, ability of our machines, statistical, uh, is due to a number of factors. I'll tell you more in a moment, but here's a quick synthesis. So traditional cooking uh, uh, versus uh, uh, sort of machine learning uh, cooking. Uh, so that traditional uh, way of doing uh, logic-based uh, AI was ingredients, recipe, output, dishes. Look how the recipes and the dishes are invented in the new way of doing uh, AI, especially machine learning, which is really the powerhouse here, again, uh, of the whole business. Um, if you do even more, not reinforced cooking, so to speak, well, all you need are uh, essentially uh, the, the recipes and the thing will uh, output dishes and ingredients. More on this, uh, I guess you, you got the, 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 the gist. Um, once you have the data and the results, you can output the, the, uh, the rules. In other words, you output the ability to do that job uh, increasingly well. Why do I tell you all this? Uh, because uh, uh, in all this um, uh, perspective, um, and more of the same, uh, if you get the, the general sense of what is going on here, this is what uh, has made a huge difference. This is the amount of data that we have today. That's why you can train uh, a neural network in ways that when I was teaching neural networks in the uh, 90s was inconceivable. We just did not have the computational power, of course, not the algorithms, because those were well known already, but the data on which to train all, all these uh, amazing tools. The curve that is more interesting, sorry, the, feature that is more interesting. People tend to look at the people like you to concentrate on the left hand side. Look when we virtually had no data. 2005. No wonder when I was in the 90s trying to do this, uh, you, know, uh, you know, my colleagues in the computer science department, etc. Just, just didn't have anything vaguely resembling what we have today. All the data that we have today have been generated in the past 15, 20 years. Anything that is less than 0 0.1 zettabyte is the entire history of humanity. I'll repeat this because it is really extraordinary. The whole history of humanity, when we started scratching cows on the walls of a cave up to yesterday, 2005, make it one less than 0 0.1 point, um, uh, 0 0.1 zettabyte. Anything else? The 163 generated by us. That's why we can do what we can do today. So what has really happened here? Well, with this massive amount of computational power, increasingly faster, increasingly cheap, and huge, huge amount of data, we have lower cost, more computation, as I told you, more data, more machine learning, better algorithms, more IoT, Internet of Things, and more on life. Remember that point number one? We live in this world increasingly. A lot of things that we do today are born digital. They don't become digital. This is for another day, but when people start talking about, for example, digital citizenship, well, it's one thing if you think in terms of translation from to, and another thing to say you are born as a digital citizen. Some documents, they were never on paper. They were already you not know, digital, etc. So these factors, uh, and that's point number two, there will be you know, a few more uh, coming, have made this enormous shift. So much so that today, you know, as you can tell here, uh, the use of uh, things like Alexa um, are so common, Siri and so on, that by mm, next year, uh, almost two billion people uh, will be uh, interacting mostly with data and other people through vocal organizations, uh, uh, vocal interactions. Why this is so significant? Well, because you know, apart from this little group here, most people don't write, don't read. Uh, and if they know how to write and read, uh, they don't do that regularly. Uh, so if we get out of our bubble, you know, consider that there are hundreds of millions of people who cannot write, cannot read, and they you know, uh, equally struggle with that anyway vocal uh, interactions is going to be the future.
whether we like it or not. There's a third factor. Um, this is a little bit more complicated. I hope uh, not to be too confusing, uh, forgive me. So imagine uh, for the computer scientists here, uh, I know that you know, and so forgive me for being really simplistic. Complexity is a, an unfortunate word used by too many people as if it were equivalent to complicated. Not so. Complicated means I don't get it. Complex means it is something in the system that is requiring more intelligence, understanding, and so on. It's not my fault. It's the fault of the system that is so complex. Complexity comes in a variety of uh, flavors, mathematically uh, very specific, very clear. Uh, unfortunately, again, I know plenty of my colleagues in philosophy department that they love the word complex, not here. So imagine that uh, we uh, translate um, uh, complexity in terms of amount of resources required to solve a problem, which is the standard way of understanding complexity in the mathematical context. How much does it cost to solve that problem? Normally the problem is a computational problem, but no, allow me some generalization. And imagine that uh, uh, those computational resources on the X axis go from zero to one. Now, if we need very, very few resources, very little indeed, is almost zero, we will call that task simple. If we require an increasing amount of resources, uh, it gets more and more complex, then we will call it that complex all the way to one. Now put on the other side, the Y axis, skills. Now this is also another field in psychology. I won't bother you with the details, but it can also be clearly and more precisely quantified how uh, easy or difficult a particular task is for say a human being, normally in terms of dexterity with your hands, etc. And there are stages in, in life uh, where you uh, and you get a little bit older to be able to do something else. Uh, anyone who uh, has been playing sports knows that uh, that skills uh, can be quantified and unfortunately at some point you reach a threshold. Um, now, make it easy equal zero, difficult equal one. Some examples, and we're getting there. Suppose that the task is to turn on the light, just a click, on, off. That's very uh, simple in terms of how many steps it takes, only one. A baby can do that. So skills, very easy. Turn the light on is easy and simple. I hope you are with me. Pause for a moment, digest this. Tie your shoes. Well, that is still simple. I won't say, oh wow, amazing, you can tie your shoes. But it's difficult in terms of skills. I remember when I learned to do that. Uh, before that, my mom used to do it, or my dad. But I didn't know how to tie my shoes. So it's very high up in the skills, uh, so to speak, but very down in terms of uh, simplicity uh, uh, and complex. How about dishwashing? Well, dishwashing requires lots of steps. In fact, again, the computational people know that I am oversimplifying almost to a point that is almost wrong. It's not wrong, but almost. But the more dishes you have, the more resources are required. The more water, the more steps, the more uh, soap and so on. So dishwashing is pretty complex. But as my wife reminds me, it's, in terms of skills, totally simple, easy. Even a philosopher can do it. Take the dish, soap, water, dry, take another dish, tum, tum, tum. the algorithm is super easy. What about ironing shirts? Well, no, no that is difficult and complex. Uh, and that's what I remind my wife. So, um, so uh, you can tell that uh, there is a way of organizing things here in such a way that you move from easy to difficult, from simple to complex. So the following sentence is what I wanted to tell you five minutes ago, but if I had told you this, it would have been totally incomprehensible. The future of AI is to move from difficult to complex. I hope you get that now. Skills that are required to do difficult things get translated into heavily greedy, resource-intensive procedures that are immensely complex, but totally easy. Let me give you an example. So we get the real thing. Uh, I hope this is, will work. Uh, I will need, uh, Massimiano, uh, your uh, feedback uh, to see whether you can see the video, which is starting now. 
Can you see the video? Yes, I can. There is no audio. Huh? There is no audio. Um, okay. So I, I muted the, the video because you can read uh, what's going on there. This is a real robot. Uh, it's been um, uh, created by colleagues at um, uh, Madrid University, University of Madrid, uh, Carlos uh, III. And um, it's about my size. You no, know, it's a 1.8. Uh, and it takes a room. You had to put the, the shirt there. But it does iron the shirt. Is this the future of, of um, say, AI, robotic, and so on? If you got the previous slide, the answer is no, not a chance. Why? Because it's not transforming the environment into something such that complexity is what determines the success of the task, not high skills. This thing has been built looking at Star Wars. It's like us. It does the shirts like us. Bad idea. The following one, this already on the market, uh, several thousand dollars, but you can buy it and you should be able to see the, the video. See what happens here? It's like a dishwasher. You build a whole environment around the super, super simple, but highly complex abilities of the machine. You transform the environment so that simplicity uh, and complexity work together to achieve something that actually works. Now, this is, is a big thing, uh, not to put the place anywhere in the house. I'm not sure it's gonna be a great success, but I hope that the distinction here is quite clear. Think about driverless cars. We're not building robots that replace us behind the wheel. We are reconsidering, rethinking cars, roads, environment, the whole city, so that you do not need a wheel, a gear, pedals, it's a completely different thought about what the car looks like. This is the future, that car is the future. A robot sitting behind the wheel is uh, basically uh, all the way of thinking about robots, like big slaves doing things instead of us. We're getting close to uh, ending this first part, which is the most difficult one, and then uh, the rest will be much easier. What determines the success of the future of AI? Well, here, uh, people coming from a, a legal or an ethics uh, background would recognize a classic distinction between two kinds of rules. There are rules uh, that are um, so-called constitutive of the game. Think of a, a chess or any board game. You don't have an activity first and then rules coming to organize the activity one way or another. You don't start by moving pieces on a board and say, oh, no, 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 let's agree that that piece moved that way and so on. So the game is made by the rules. There is nothing before the rules. Those are constitutive rules. Then there are regulative or, if you like, constraining rules. Think of football, for example. Well, you start kicking the ball around, you can uh, hit a, a ball with a racket, or you can uh, uh, have a, a nest and then not play one side or the other, etc. Golf, you name it, uh, beach volley. All these are things that happen before and then get regulated by constraining. Can't do that, can't do this, no, more on that, that's okay, that's not okay. So these are different rules. These are rules that we call regulative or constraining. Now, all games, and in fact, all human activities that are under some norms can be organized into two, two blocks. Those that are made by the rules and those that are constrained by the rules. Driving, for example, is a constraining game, not a constitutive game. Now, once you get this distinction, the following is quite obvious. Imagine the data. Remember what I said about complexity? Uh, computational problems eat like food, they eat resources. Some of the resources they eat, they consume, are data for training. Remember you know, the example of the uh, carbonara de pasta? So you give them a lot of data, and with this data, they learn how to cook this and that. They learn, for example, to recognize cats. What we have normally are historical data. A large database of lots of cats, all nicely labeled, cat one, two, three, four, etc feed that into the uh, machine and the machine learns to recognize cats. Then we have, not for today, but uh, if anyone wants to know more, uh, maybe during the Q&A, we have mixed 
kind of data. Uh, they are generated by uh, adversarial networks, so-called uh, GANs. But the important thing is to concentrate on the synthetic data. Synthetic data are those that are generated by the machine to train the machine. I'll say this again. Synthetic data are generated entirely by the machine to train the machine. How is that possible? Remember the, the distinction before? If I have a game where the rules make the game, then just working with the rules, I can produce all the games I need. I can play against myself. I don't need historical data. I can just give the system the rules and say, play chess for X amount of millions of games and learn from your data without ever checking one single book of chess playing ever. That is why we have today systems that play chess not only better than anyone else full stop but also sometimes in ways that are quote-unquote innovative people have never seen that kind of chess game before because the system has learned from its own games has played against itself learning improving losing losing better and better until winning winning better better better, better until it becomes unbeatable so the future of ai among many other uh, sort of roads lies into synthetic data. Why? Because synthetic data raise no issue at the source of privacy. The machine has generated all the data itself. You don't need to check human being one, two, three, million, 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 to know that is a human being, for example. So on this, I can come back uh, and I'll tell you more uh, how this uh, works. But this is the picture I gave you uh, until now. And now the rest of the, the day, uh, sorry, the, 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 uh, the time we have today together is going to be much easier. The future of AI uh, lies in the move from logic to statistics into enveloping the world so that the simple, um, very complex, remember, abilities of this AI are successful. We are changing the world into an AI-friendly environment, not the other way around. We're not unleashing robots in the world, driving cars like we do. We transform cars so that they can go around as we want. There's uh, no, a difference between uh, uh, difficult versus complex. The more complex things are, the, the easier it becomes for uh, a computer, uh, any machine. If they are difficult, that is going to be really hard. Um, we need uh, to focus on what rules uh, are we talking about. There is a whole other lecture for another day into how you transform activities into games and games into constitutive rules games so that you can generate your own uh, data. And of course, I told you about historical versus synthetic data. Now, with that picture out of the way, I said, you can relax now uh, because um, uh, that was the slightly technical really simple but a bit more demanding part the rest is going to be uh, easy going and uh, as they say downhill no we the, uh, there are many challenges that this remember divorce between engineering artifacts that are able to uh, perform some activities with success and any need to be intelligent doing so this divorce generates a lot of problems it also generates a lot of opportunities what you see here uh, is you know, how AI could be used well, the opportunities. It could be used to enable human self-realization. Um, it could enhance human agency, ours. It could increase societal capabilities, us working together. It could cultivate societal cohesion, us working together better and more peacefully. But of course, what we hear a lot about is the red stuff. Uh, when AI is overused, too much or misuse, wrong kind. And it's the counterpart of what I just said, devaluing human skills, removing human responsibility, reducing human control, eroding human self-determination, as you can read. But let us also not forget the amber sort of uh, part where AI could be underused. You have it, it could do something good, but you don't use it. The health sector is full of those examples where we know we could use it, but we are not sure because uh, there are no real frameworks. We don't know whether we're doing the right thing. We are worried about taking responsibility. Those are called uh, so-called opportunity costs, and the opportunity costs are increasing as we speak these days. We do have general frameworks already in place for 
uh, AI and its ethics in order to keep the green, avoid the red, and don't pay the opportunity cost in the amber section. This is a quick slide, uh, a paper we just recently published with uh, uh, one of my uh, super bright uh, doctoral students, uh, Josh Cowles. Um, it's a quick list uh, where I show you where some of the international uh, frameworks on the ethics of AI converge. Um, we picked up the uh, uh, middle one, the AI for people, the one that we run. Uh, I was uh, chair of the AI for people project and um, middle ground, if you can tell and double check whether all the others would were stressing beneficence, normal efficiency, autonomy, justice, explicability. I can tell you much more about this, but this is just to show you that, yes, we have frameworks out there. They need to translate into practices. Principles are very good in terms of uh, steering the debate in a particular direction, but it's only the translation into practices, then, then they will tell us really what those principles meant. And as an example, let me just show you at the bottom of that table, the Beijing AI principles. They're basically uh, not exactly the equivalent of, but close to what the EU has in terms of an ethics framework for AI. Not exactly the same because it's not government endorsed, but we're getting close. There is a missing uh, part, autonomy, but even where uh, justice, for example, is in question, it's a different kind of justice. Uh, you look at the practices informed by those principles, and all of a sudden you have a different picture. Uh, basically, as we know, where societal um, uh, values um, uh, can override individual rights. Uh, and that is something that, for example, we Europeans will never uh, accept. Moving on uh, to the challenges. So, so far, uh, AI uh, as a divorce, uh, I think you at least should have clear in mind, you don't have to agree with me necessarily, but you should have clear in mind that we're talking about agency and intelligence no, saying goodbye to each other. Yes. <coughs> Give me. Very quickly, the sort of uh, AI ethics challenges and frameworks that are being um, generated by this divorce, uh, what kind of challenges are we looking at? Again, I'll make it quick uh, because we don't have uh, much time. I will point out five huge areas of concern. These are not five problems. They are more sort of um, a bunch of issues, uh, uh, all uh, regions of concern, uh, but also of opportunities. Number one, we should make AI work against wrongdoing. Uh, the whole uh, world here of deployment of AI in uh, uh, criminal activities is blooming. Think for a moment about identity theft. Literally, when they steal your uh, bank, bank details and you know, your money. Until recently, it was um, um, an art, so to speak. Today is an industry because you can use AI to do that. You can use AI to you know, bombard the bank, get all the passwords. Do, 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 do. So you can industrialize, for example, identity theft. So we should do exactly the opposite. Here, the point I want to stress, but of many others, is vulnerability. If anything, the digital revolution has made vulnerability a widespread issue. Uh, it has democratized vulnerability, so to speak. Anyone is vulnerable. In fact, if you are an interesting customer, you are even more vulnerable than other people. If you have a credit card, you're more vulnerable than someone who doesn't have a credit card in the digital world. The poor guy who doesn't have a uh, credit card, only has a bit of cash, well, uh, runs less risks than the rich guy who has maybe five credit cards, just to uh, be trivial. Two, uh, another area of big concern or opportunities make AI enhance human decision and control. Well, here, uh, the question could be addressed, for example, in terms of data on uh, um, mega cities. The data there are rather uncontroversial. Um, humanity, at least before coronavirus and all this talking about you know, re-occupying uh, uh, spaces that we have left behind, uh, until recently was fast moving towards uh, urban life in immensely complex uh, environments. You know, these mega cities, think of Sao Paulo, you know, 20, 30 million people living in the same city. Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, now, in that context, complexity 
is at the same time a problem and a solution. That's human history. We've been solving increasing degrees of complexity by throwing more complexity at complexity. And therefore, uh, what I'm suggesting here is the challenge is to make sure that we can use AI to deal with the complexity of these environments. Of course, here, before was the bias of AI as a risk, here is the opacity. Do we know what the AI is doing? Can we actually pinpoint where the problems are, where the decisions have occurred? Uh, more work needs to be done, um, and I can tell you more if you like during the Q&A. Point number three, support human responsibility, not erode human responsibility. Well, in this case, I think we cannot avoid uh, sort of uh, climate change, global warming. This is also controversial, unless you are Donald Trump and another couple of morons around the world. We are boiling this planet to death as we speak. There won't be many generations left uh, in the future if we don't take some serious measures. AI could be a big help here. Also a problem, of course, AI consumes energy, uh, electricity. I can tell you much more about this. We have two ongoing projects, one related to the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, and AI, the other one uh, with the Vodafone Institute on uh, AI and uh, uh, climate change. Uh, the data are in some ways reassuring, but not enough. So more for this uh, in the Q&A if you like. It should make us more human. Um, autonomy here is the, is the key. You should not erode uh, our autonomy, but it should empower it. Now, if you think that this is a, a bit of a philosophical point, consider that today a lot of the AI products uh, that we have around are essentially a recommender systems. What you find on Netflix, on Amazon, and virtually on any website that is selling anything, any service, any good, anything whatsoever, there is a recommendation system behind. The recommender system behind works with a bit it may not be smart, but it's really and it's constantly trying to guess what you want and give it to you. So the erosion of human autonomy uh, is a ongoing slow burning problem that we will see in the next decades. One day someone will wake up and say, oh my goodness, what have we done to human independence, autonomy, freedom, capacity to uh, determine their own uh, individual lives? Well, we should take care of that now. And it should work for humanity. I'll spend a bit more on this because this is a, an endless topic also in, in Italy, certainly in the UK. Uh, you know, polarization and uh, uh, do it yourself, so to speak, uh, is one of the issues. But do robots, does AI steal jobs? Well, the answer is a robust no. However, there is a problem. Once again, in this context, it's very easy to go for headlines and the obvious. The obvious is usually wrong. There are no robots intelligent out there. Robots are not stealing jobs. But those problems are not just silly no, headlines. They also hide the real issues behind. So this is, uh, once again, uh, a, a quick overview. Uh, all you need to see are bubbles on Cartesian axis all over the place. If this were a paper by one of my students, I would just send him back and say, no, this is too vague. These are predictions by famous, important institutions about how many millions of jobs will be lost thanks to automation in the United States. As you can tell, no one gives you the same data and the same uh, timeline. There's something wrong here. What is wrong is the methodology behind. They're all based more or less on interviews. A bunch of people call another bunch of people and say, Peter, John, what do you think? How many millions? Well, five, six, ten, two, one. And that's all you get. The McKenzie or, of the world, um, uh, scary pictures. Surprising to see also the Bank of England out there. Uh, now, this is totally uh, unreliable uh, guessing. Look at the bottom line, 2036. So the Bank of England is predicting something happening in 2036. Now, let me remind you, this is 2020. It's 16 years from now. Now imagine someone in 1920 or 1930 predicting about the world 16 years later. They would have made such a big mistake. They would have no idea whatsoever. 
how can you possibly do this apart from uh, now some magic that we don't know about so this is harry potter statistics okay what is the mistake behind and then i'll show you some real statistics two mistakes work is not a pie anyone have, has done any economics in this group knows that perfectly well there is no finite amount of work such that if you take it i don't have it that's not true what is true is that there is a threshold of what is economically not viable, meaning there's plenty of work. It just doesn't make any sense to do it. Think about cleaning the house um, back home. Well, you can clean more and more and more. At some point, you run out of time, resources, money, uh, the, the life oh, and the, the, the will to leave. Um, so this is not what is going on. It's the economically viable threshold that moves. Something doesn't make any sense now in terms of good business, but it will tomorrow. So what technology does is to move that economically viability. Cheap airlines were inconceivable only a few decades ago. Today, you can fly for 100 euros almost anywhere in Europe. Easy, why? Because technology made that difference. Maybe a business uh, model and so on. So consider not a pie, a threshold, the threshold moves. And the other thing is that threshold moves according to what technology? Well, this is the real statistics. This is the last report from the American Tracking Association, um, 2015. They uh, look at how many jobs are available and how many jobs will be offered. And the scissors, so to speak, the uh, divide between the two is, if you cannot read carefully, is almost 240,000 drivers missing on the American market, the Track Driving Association. Why are they missing? Well, they're missing increasingly because not they are badly paid. Um, the, a truck driver in the United States is paid more than $60,000 a year, which is basically what an uh, assistant professor would get at university normally. So not bad. Uh, we've been telling them a story. There is no job anymore. Drivers are coming. Truck driving. Not true. These are the jobs in the car industry the one that produce cars. Uh, the big deep is the 2008, 2009 crisis. That's again, American uh, jobs. These are uh, jobs of people who produce cars. No, not, not the sell, not the buy. You can tell we're almost back where we were uh, uh, at the beginning of the crisis. So there are plenty of jobs out there too. So what is really happening? Uh, this is another example. Since we tried to uh, have a, a driverless shop, a shop where you have nobody at the till. You just go in, scan, paying with a credit card, uh, leave. It was uh, presented uh, in, uh, uh, let me just double check, in 29 April 2019, uh, yesterday, so to speak. Great success. It's going to be fantastic. This is the future. 10 September 2019, close down. Why? Because you really want to go to that shop or to a shop where you are helped and you don't have to do everything by yourself. Well, the answer is simple. The customer said, I don't think so. No, thank you. So there is a problem. Uh, this is again uh, a couple of years ago uh, by now, 2018. Uh, this was uh, Lloyd Banking uh, sending home 6,240 people because he was automating a lot of stuff, rehiring 8,240. So the first reaction is, oh, that was fantastic. That's great news. We've got 2,000 extra jobs. That's really good news. Not entirely, because the people who have been hired are not the same of the people who have been sacked. People in their 50s, shall we say, like me, uh, 55, who don't have those skills will remain unemployed. The newly employed are the ones who have the skills. So the people out are not the same people in, and that's why this is a problem. But as you can tell, it's not robots are coming and stealing my jobs. There won't be jobs in the future. Not true. We just don't have enough people, for example, in the engineering sector, in Italy and in Europe, hundreds of thousands of jobs missing, and we don't know where to find them. The trouble is that, well, that is precisely the problem, that the people who are being prepared today are not prepared for those jobs, and those are the jobs available. So the mismatch, the um, asymmetry in the market, that is the issue. A lot of interfaces, jobs that uh, on the left hand side have disappeared the gentleman who pushed the button for you to drive the elevator there was a time when you had to have a license to operate an elevator that's why you had to have a human being 
change legislation, no license, boom, their job disappeared one day to the next. The lady uh, driving a car, maybe we will reinvent cars that will not need an interface, that human that translates instructions into no, behavior and behavior into instructions. Or the gentleman at the uh, oil pump. That is an extraordinary bad design. We have more than 1 billion cars in, uh, in the world and each of them requires a human being picking up the pump, sticking it and back again. Amazing. I mean, we have robots on Mars, but we cannot have a self-filling car. And mind my words, we're doing the same with electric cars. Is anyone no, ever no, pick up, stick it in and put it back? Well, uh, that's the Tesla for you. You have to do it yourself. Uh, more on this, if you like, there is a model, no, Tesla tried uh, something else uh, another day. The lady at the till is also probably going to disappear. We are increasingly scanning uh, the beans ourselves, but there will be more jobs as interfaces between something complicated on one hand, something complicated on the other, complexity, complexity, and so on. It's just that those interfaces will be entirely different from the job interfaces that we had in the past. So it's not the end of the work, but the end of some skills, the end of some business models, the end of work as job, job will equal work. We might have more, more jobs, a variety of jobs in, in our life. So it's gonna be slightly more articulated. And I hope the end of job as an, my identity. I am my job. Mm, that started in the 19th century. You read Jane Austen, that's not exactly you know, what happens there, uh, but it's beginning. It's the doctor, so to speak, or the lawyer. Yeah, the professional qualification. We shouldn't identify ourselves uh, with our jobs. We are not uh, our job. Uh, we are many more things. And so that shouldn't be such a bad idea. Your so business card, so to speak, one day shouldn't say simply, oh, I am job description. And governance. So we're coming to the end. Uh, forgive me that uh, for taking uh, slightly more time than uh, expected, but almost there. You might have realized that the challenge now is no longer the technology innovation which comes cheaply but what we do with it the governance of the digital is the governance of the digital that requires a new human project uh, that's why all this ends up being a political capital p problem it always does if you scratch the surface sooner or later issues become political meaning what we do together as a society not me individual not you individual but we as a group as a society as a community as a, a country you heard uh, about the green and blue and you might have seen the the, the, the italian uh, version um i think there is a future where the human project is the green and the blue are putting together all the issues and potentialities of our habitats largely and broadly understood so the green for every environment urban social political economic biological of course but also the family etc and super powerful technologies i just show you, you now the tip of the iceberg ai but also internet of things large data sets uh, of course the social media of course the telephone that you have in your pocket and so on all this put together i think is the green and the blue that we should work together for is the human project that could give us the governance for a proper project for the ai which then starts dealing with all the things we said before the future of ai is a bit of a, a divorce and a marriage is the divorce between agency and intelligence and is the marriage between the green and the blue basically that's the whole message of this almost 45 minutes or so that we have spent together it's a simple message it's a divorce between engineering agency on the one hand and the need of intelligence on the other and it has to be a marriage between the group thank you Thank you. Thank you, Luciano. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, it was a bit longer than I expected. Uh, no, no, it, it, was, uh, it was really, I'm, I'm always impressed by your ability to, to present clearly um, issues and topics that are, are, of course, very, very complex and also by your ability to, to ask questions and to, to pose questions that uh, are relevant to, to many fields. They are certainly relevant uh, to the social sciences. Um, 
I see we have a truly international audience today. I recognize colleagues from uh, India, South Africa. So I think it is, time. <laughs> it is time to open the floor for your questions. If you, if you can write your question in the chat, uh, I'm sure Professor Floridi would be happy to, to answer. So I'm checking yeah. the chat uh, just in case. Um. Maybe while they while they write, I I might ask a question myself. It, it might be very naive for a philosopher like you, Luciano. But uh, as a as a sociologist listening to you, I was wondering whether uh, the fallacy of the forecast that you that you showed is. Um, uh, is, is due to the fact that they are mostly focusing on technological change and they're not uh, focusing on, on the, the, the change that will be needed on the, on, uh, on the side of human beings as social actors. I don't know if you can, if you can say a little bit more on this. You, you, you're so right, so right. I mean, the, the whole let's predict how many jobs will disappear because of automation in the United States it's always about the United States because we have the data there, uh, at least some data, uh, so it's easier. Uh, started with a paper actually published by colleagues here in Oxford, um, which made you know, big waves. If you read that paper, something that people don't, um, at the beginning, they say our predictions, which are quite fanciful, to be honest, uh, are based on the following assumption, many assumptions, one of which is the following. And I hope you're sitting comfortably because it's amazing. We shall assume the legislation doesn't change and makes no difference. <laughs> Which is like saying, let me give you weather forecast, but allow me to assume that there are no winds or if there are winds, they make no difference. It's called rubbish. Okay. If a student or mine were to do that, he would not be able to get a master degree. But this paper now went all over the place because, of course, it was a big graph. It was this uh, sort of showing that if you are something like a, a personal trainer, which of course we all have a personal trainer. Who doesn't have a personal trainer? Uh, your job is safe because people don't want to have their hands you know, uh, no, 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 or anything you know, touch. You don't want to have your massage done by a robot. But if you are a cab driver, no. Well, your job is lost. You're dead because they, no, the driverless cars are coming. They're not coming. I mean, I, I have interacted a lot with uh, big uh, car makers in, uh, sorry, in, in Europe, uh, Audi, Volkswagen included, and it's always about where we can do this, not on the road in your little village. So all these uh, assumptions are tiring because, of course, the whole thing is fueled, and I stop here, by the need to make a wave, big titles, something that today will make me you know, famous and invited to the next conference, fees. Etc. It's all about, you know, essentially, uh, fake news. Uh, it's just that uh, credible fake news, and it's very disappointing. The, the, the scheme that I, no, sorry, the, 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 uh, the slide that I show you, uh, it's just the, the, one of the many that are available online. Uh, anyone who has predicted th those millions of, of jobs going has not checked a couple of sociological features. Where are the countries which have had the highest um, uh, presence of robotics uh, in their industry? Japan, for example, South Korea, not a problem of employment there, not because of this. So you're saying, okay, the countries that have the highest presence of robotics are not the ones with the highest level of uh, unemployment. Something's not quite working and on and on and on. So, uh, so I think that you know, look at the United States, what's the level of unemployment in the United States? It's, it's not something that is determined by automation as is sold ordinarily. What it is true is that it's a major, massive transformation of the, of the job market. Yes, absolutely. But then you know, it's also, for example, jobs for driverless uh, cars, yes, but also Uber drivers. That's made possible by technology, full stop. Any shop on eBay made possible by uh, technology. Anyone on Amazon selling technology. 
in mind, I'm not saying that is a good development because it may not be, but I'm saying if you're looking just for one variable, more jobs, less job, the answer AI robots are stealing, are going to run, it's a silly answer. It's one, more complicated, and two, probably not true. Thank you. Any, any question from the, from the audience? You can, you can write your uh, question in Italian and I can translate if you prefer. Oh, you can tell me. I mean, we can talk. <laughs> okay. I, I, I'd like to, uh, to ask something. Uh, if, Please. If uh, there is uh, uh, anyone, there is no anyone. So I want to ask you to the professor uh, uh, I, uh, about the problem of the um, the, ex the ex detonation of cultural uh, and uh, cultural uh, material culture, and uh, the problem of uh, the um, the colonization uh, of the EA in a private uh, in private space, for example, and. Um, I want to ask uh, to the professor if uh, is there a solution, uh, a, par a partial solution uh, a or a political solution uh, uh, to resolve these, uh, these problems, these issues that the uh, EA um, um, uh, put in, in the space, in the, in the public debate. So uh, is there a... Um, a uh, possibility to 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 resolve these problems or uh, or not, in your opinion? I, I'm I'm not sure I understood what problem you were referring to. Um, uh, I I'm I tried to make an example an example. Yes. Uh, for example, the the data the big data that uh, are um, um, they are collected. Uh, online uh, with the Facebook or uh, Instagram and uh, social network more in general mm -hmm. uh, that are used to uh, orienting the, the, the people opinion so yeah. and uh, especially in a political debate uh, there are uh, uh, these uh, big data that uh, uh, that are used by the spin doctors or the politicians yeah. to orienting the, the uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, sorry, I, I, I didn't quite uh, get at the, at the beginning of the question. It is an important question. Um, so how um, AI, together with other things, because AI by itself doesn't do much, but AI plus, as you said, uh, uh, the large data sets, so we can call them big data for simplicity. Terminology is a bit vague, but that's fine. Uh, so huge amount of data, AI uh, sort of uh, using this data to uh, shape, influence political choices, social uh, issues, and so on, uh, orient essentially public opinion, shape, construct public opinion. There is a problem. Uh, it's a problem paradoxically in the most advanced democracies. So the more advanced you are, uh, uh, the more likely it is that you have a very developed uh, IT sort of industry with <laughs> the skills, <laughs> the abilities, the will to misuse this. Um, so if you are in a, in a poor country with not very little, it's perhaps a little bit less uh, present. So it's almost like a, 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 the, the quote unquote destiny of uh, highly developed democracies to run into this problem. It's also seems to me its own uh, solution, um, but we need to, once again, uh, step into politics, uh, capital P. These tools, uh, and I like to stress the fact that they are tools. I mean, it's a technology in the hands of human beings. How we use them, it's up to us. They don't have a mind of their own. They don't simply you know, get unleashed and, oops, my goodness, well, someone decided that unleashing it was a good idea. Yes, they can be autonomous you know, once gone, but maybe you should not let them go uh, and you should not allow X, Y, and Z to do this and that. At this point, to be more precise, we have essentially uh, three entry points where politics, legislation, uh, civil society, our desire to do the right thing can make a difference. At the very beginning, in terms of business um, uh, strategies, business models. Uh, 
a business model that is uh, mm -hmm. uh, geared around only consumerism, only advertisement, is already a problem. We need to change that if we don't like what comes out of it. And we can do that in a sort of European way. We don't have to you know, be too radical. We just have to be a bit intelligent. Uh, okay. The second point where you can enter into is um, making sure that there's uh, a, a separation of areas. So uh, you mentioned Facebook where anything yeah. happens at the same time. So say, let, to simplify, on Facebook, you find someone posting something interesting, then rubbish, then fake news, okay. then maybe a piece of something you didn't want to see in the first place, and then something yeah. good. So all mixing up. Imagine that that were the case in a sort of supermarket where the rotten food and the good food is all together. Uh, it's up to you to choose. No, separate. Because the rubbish will not disappear, but we can put it on one side. And then at the end, third entry point is responsibility. Responsibility meaning accountability, liability, the whole uh, sort of legal framework that makes sure that those who do not separate, those who do not change the business models, are going to be responsible for what they do with, say, AI. So back to AI, what, let me give you a, finally a, a simple example. We are, in this country, uh, in the UK, already using uh, AI uh, in the um, judiciary uh, context to determine uh, tickets, penalties, and so on. Okay. It's a big deal. We just use a piece of, uh, say, smart technology to determine and this was the, one of the biggest scandals so far in IT ever in the UK to mm -hmm. determine the actual outcome of the exams of all students in high school so that, as you probably know, they may or may not go to a certain university rather than another. So that particular result determines whether you get to Oxford or not, and therefore whether your life will be the one of an Oxford student or not. So it's a huge, big deal. And whoever was in, uh, in charge, and don't let me talk about this, as I know more than I want to share, uh, thought they were the scientists, big, big baba boom, big sort of uh, backlash, throw everything away, we have another problem now, I can tell you more if you like, but someone decided that was a good idea. Then someone is gonna pay. Uh, and in fact, a couple of people have already been sacked, etc. So you can tell that when we do the right thing as a society, yes, we have plenty of means to do things in the right way. It's the political will that needs to be put in place. Okay. So uh, it's important to, to, uh, to, to make it a, an issue about the, the question of uh, the responsibility of the individual that uh, can determine what is rubbish, uh, what is uh, uh, important information, and what is no, in, what is no important uh, information. Uh, so, uh, this. Um, is it, I, I missed something, so uh, let, let me rephrase this. Uh, okay. I, um, it should not be up to the individual only. Okay. It, it, yes, it's, I not, agree. it's not what happens everywhere. If you go to um, a, a chemist, uh, a pharmacy in, the, in American English, you're given something, you are not told, oh, by the way, look, uh, whatever I give you, uh, it's up to you to check whether it's okay or not. Well, no. Okay. No, if you give me something, uh, someone somewhere is checking. You take a train, you're not signing you know, a, uh, uh, some form saying, oh, and by the way, uh, you take the train at your own risks because you didn't check whether it was a safe train or not. No, someone somewhere okay. has checked that the train was okay. So everywhere in the world, no, big pharma, transport, oil, car industry, uh, automobile, food, you name it, we have rules in place saying, okay, someone is checking and someone goes wrong, someone's gonna pay, etc." The AI world, uh, or say the digital world, is just a little bit immature in my eyes uh, and it needs to be regulated properly. We are making good steps in Europe. We will make more steps, just wait. But AI legislation is, as we speak, boiling uh, in Brussels. So I just hope that it will be the right legislation uh, because you can also make a total fucked up mess by you know, issuing the wrong legislation. But that is the sort of direction of traveling. That seems to me sort of unquestionable. 
no matter what Zuckerberg says. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we, we have Thank time you. for another couple of, couple of questions. Uh, Lapo was uh, thanking you for the for the talk. I uh, really enjoyed it, and I think he was connecting with this previous question by asking whether cases like Cambridge Analytica are likely to happen again. Uh, um, but maybe shall we take Davide's question also, and then maybe you can you can reply to to both, or you want to or you want to answer this uh, specific question. So I think Cambridge Analytica showed. Uh, among many other problems, one in particular which concerns me uh, since you know, a long time ago, you can tell I've been doing this job for a while, uh, a long, long time ago when uh, there was no web, there was only internet, um, we were worried about uh, privacy control uh, influence by the state. We're still coming from a world where, you know, remember, uh, we had seen uh, a wall in Berlin. We had seen the Cold War, no, like, like kids. I mean, we, we, that was the world in which we thought, yeah, things are going to happen. And so the, um, shall we call that the threat was from the state. We're talking really still in the 90s, uh, so about 30 years ago or so. Once the internet became the web and the web became uh, commercial, we started worried about worrying about other things, not just the state, um, no, think Snowden, but also Cambridge Analytica. But why Cambridge Analytica is more than just that? Because we started worrying about privacy. Now, what do they do with my data? Uh, are they you not know, sort of selling my profile, etc.? No. The worrisome thing about Cambridge Analytica is that corporate control of my data got together with state control of my freedom and choices. When that soldering, that linking happens, that is where I am really scared. Because if on the one hand, the state doesn't have much about me, doesn't have as much as Facebook has, I uh, can do only that little, but yeah, so it's limited. When Facebook has all that massive amount of data and so on, is to send me another pair of shoes, I can live with that. It's when the two come together. Massive amount of data, massive knowledge of profile and so on, plus the state. And remember the state, no, this is not the right place where to remind this, I know you know, but is part of the definition of all that is the legal control of violence. That's what Facebook does not have, the police knocking at the door. Now, put these two things together and you know why were so skeptical about, say, the coronavirus um, um, app. It's not that everybody's stupid. So oh, you give so many data to Facebook. Oh. Well, <laughs> no, it's a bit more complicated than that. Because when I give my Facebook, uh, Facebook my data, all I get, yes, is another advertisement for a T-shirt or, or whatever, a tie. Okay, big deal. Who cares? And I give them to the state, and I don't know whether the state is going to go full circuit and say, oh, you know, now I know who you are, where you live, what you do, da, 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 plus your whole health, plus have you done this, have you, et cetera, et cetera. So the, immediately the average person gets a little bit suspicious. Saying, oh, I'm not so sure. I'm, you know, in doubt, I'd rather not. Given the mess that everybody has uh, made with the coronavirus apps, just to stay on the topic, maybe some suspicious words not unjustified. Oh, mind you, I, I am one who has had the first pilot sort of uh, app on his phone because I was in the uh, advisory committee for the UK government when we developed the app that went complete bananas and it was total rubbish. And I lost my voice telling people, this is not gonna work. This is rubbish. There is no trust. Go, go, go. Boom, millions wasted, trust uh, lost. We started from scratch uh, because no one listens. Um, in that context, remember, is when the two come together, uh, when uh, the Facebook of the world and the governments of the world come together, then is really scary. Thank you. Uh, last question, last but not least, Davide is asking about the end of theory, Chris Anderson, uh, uh, the use of big data, and yeah. the end of theory in digitalized research. 
Yeah, no, I had uh, lots of debates, you know, whether uh, is Google uh, making us stupid, the end of theory. Um, I'm afraid this is um, uh, old news. Um, no one is supporting that anymore. Uh, it was a stupid thing to say at the time. Uh, uh, as you may imagine, I was among the people say this is rubbish. Um, but unfortunately, it took a little a while to realize that that was rubbish. Um, remember that this has been rubbish since Francis Bacon. Not, not, not yesterday. You read Francis Bacon, 17th century also, uh, and he says, well, what we need to do is induction, collect data. He didn't say data, but no, roughly. And, as, and then we will force, uh, he actually says, um, torture nature. That's, that's, and that is a very strong uh, image. Torture nature to tell us her truths. Well, uh, you probably didn't hear about this because Francis Bacon's induction, collect the data, and then build theories from the data did not go anywhere. It hasn't been going anywhere since then. Unless you have a hypothesis, unless you know what you might or might not be looking for, there is no amount of reading, facts, propositions, statements, data, information that will ever generate no, an Einstein or a PhD thesis, remember. The first thing to do that normally I teach my students is like stop reading, start thinking immediately. Now you can tell those students because they, they read too much. Uh, uh, normally best students say uh, you have to tell them, no, start reading something. But because the, the accumulation of facts would never lead to so, a flower unless you have some flower in mind. So the end of theory, uh, especially in data science, is a debate. Uh, we're actually writing as we speak a paper on this, uh, on the epistemological foundation of data science. And this, the section dedicated to the end of theory is rather thin because um, it's also the end of a debate about the end of theory. No one is generating much of an interesting hypothesis and theory without having, um, no, the sort of a moment when you say, maybe it's like this, let me check. Maybe it's like this let me check not the other way around check this check that nothing will come out of that now of course it's a cycle no the more you check the more ideas you get the more ideas that you more check and at some point something hopefully that's that's the best and finger crossed something sparks but the whole idea that the accumulation of data and the amazing results without any sense of where you're looking it's just bad philosophy of science. It's been bad philosophy of science for half millennium. Thank you, uh, Luciano. I think we should thank uh, all, all thank uh, Professor Floridi for, for uh, this wonderful seminar or webinar. And uh, thanks to all of you who connected from different parts of the world. And um, Next time, next seminar will be with Trevor Pinch from Cornell University, uh, The Truth About Technology, if, if there is a truth about technology. <laughs> and uh, again, thanks everybody. Thanks, Luciano. It was such a pleasure to have you here and we hope, we look forward to having you in Trento again. Yes, in real in life, as they say. Or, or shall we say, in analog life, because this analog is real life. life. By now, this on, is real life too. On, so. on, on life, on life, but uh, in Trento. <laughs> okay. Definitely. Take care. Good luck, everybody. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. bye.